Our message this morning is in the ninth chapter of the Gospel of John, John chapter 9, and this is the third message in a series on the blind man. I'd like to read the first 12 verses of this chapter. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground, and made clay of the spittle, and anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, and said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed, and came seeing. The neighbors, therefore, and they which before had seen him that he was blind, said, is not this he that sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. But he said, I am he. And therefore said they unto him, How were thine eyes opened? And he answered and said, A man that is called Jesus made clay, and anointed mine eyes, and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam, and wash. And I went and washed, and I received sight. And then said they unto him, Where is he? He said, I know not. It's a wonderful story. I think the setting for this story probably goes back as far as the sixth chapter of the Gospel of John, because in that sixth chapter, the Pharisees, who were the enemies of the Lord Jesus, who constantly confronted him, came to him and pressed him for an answer to the question, What? Should we do, or what can we do, that we might work the works of God? And he said, this is the works of God, that you believe on him whom he has sent. And from that time on, he demonstrated to the Pharisees the work which God had sent him to do, and the work which God was then doing in the world and would continue to do. The only work God's interested in is causing men and women to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not interested in building buildings. He's not interested in organizing people. He's not interested in promoting programs. He's not interested in selling anything or converting anybody to anything. The only thing God's interested in is seeing that poor lost sinners are saved by trusting in Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins. This is the only work of God in the world today. Yet my mailbox is filled every day with brochures and tracts and papers and letters and magazines and newspapers telling me about the great work God is doing and how much money it takes to keep it going and how much I should contribute to help God in his work. Yet the only work God is interested in is in saving faith in the hearts of the unsaved in his son Jesus. The only work Jesus came into the world to do was to die on the cross as a substitute for sinners. He didn't come into the world to start a new religion. He didn't come into the world to build an earthly organization. He didn't come into the world to establish a new philosophy of life. He didn't even come into the world to show people how to live. He came into the world to show people how to die. That God demanded sacrifice for sin, and that without the shedding of blood there was no remission of sin. And Jesus came into the world to die for sinners. He was born under the shadow of the cross. He was conscious from the day that he left his mother's womb, as far as his body was concerned, that he had come to fulfill the work of God in the death of Calvary. He was the true Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. He came to fulfill all of the Jewish sacrifices and offerings that had been offered on a thousand altars before he came. He came to be the true Passover Lamb. Under the shelter of his blood, sinners would come and find rest and peace. And the Pharisees never quite laid hold of that. They wanted an earthly conqueror 
They wanted some champion for their cause. They wanted him to crush Rome under their under his feet and set up a kingdom and reign over it and lord it over others. And he tried throughout the Gospel of John, if you'll read it carefully, to establish before them the fact that he had come on one single mission, and that was to save men. The lost are described in different ways in the Bible. They're described as being dead in trespasses and sins, being lame and cannot walk as they should. In many places they're described as blind. Darkness upon their hearts. Blind. And so in this little story of the blind man, the story is not recorded because of the miracle. The story is recorded for us because of a greater miracle. It's Jesus demonstrating in the life of the blind man what he came to do for us. It's Jesus showing in the experience of the blind man what he wants to do for all of us. He found a blind man standing by the road of life. He couldn't see where he was going. He'd never been able to see. He was born this way. Entered into this world without sight. And for all of his existence, it can only be said that he accomplished two things. He sat and begged. That was the whole story of his life, sitting by the road of life, begging. Jesus came to him. He didn't seek Jesus. It was Jesus who sought him. In the 15th chapter of Luke, we have Jesus telling the story about the shepherd. And he tells that this shepherd went out to find the sheep who was lost. He left 90 and 9 in the fold. Well, they weren't saved people that he left in the fold. They were the 90 and 9 Pharisees who were so self-righteous they said they didn't need a shepherd. They weren't lost. And so he left them and departing from them, he went out into the wilderness to seek the one that was lost. And when he found him, he put him on his shoulder and he carried him to his father's house and called his friends together to rejoice over the lost sheep he had found. And here he's showing the Pharisees how this works. He came along and found the blind man. The blind man wasn't even asking for anything. He was just sitting in his misery, just sitting along the side of the road of life, waiting to die after a meaningless existence and spending an endless eternity without knowledge, without sight, and without light. But Jesus came by. He passed others by to come to him. He left the Pharisees standing there in their self-righteousness and in their religion. And he turned to the poor, helpless beggar man, blinded in eye, could neither see where he was going nor could he lead others. Spent a lifetime stumbling. Jesus came to him. And the only thing the, the, the disciples saw in this blind man was a theological question. They said, Lord, who sinned, this man or his parents? Obviously somebody did or he wouldn't have been born blind. Jesus said, neither one. His blindness is not due to his sin. His blindness is not due to his parents' sin. His blindness was allowed. That the work of God, the work of God, might be manifest in him. That God might do something in him and do something through him and do something for him that God might be glorified and that his whole life would be used to the glory of God. This blind man, think of the, well, think of the, the predestined way of life in this, in this blind man. God allowed him to be born blind. He allowed him to live all those years in darkness. His parents and his friends must have said at one time, there's no point in that. What's the sense if God is love and letting a poor baby come into this world without eyes? But God could see more than they could see. And God knew more than they knew about it. And God knew that there was a day, a divine appointment day, a strategic time in the life of that blind man, when Jesus would touch his life. Where Jesus would not only touch his life, but Jesus would change his life. And changing his life, he would become a great testimony to the glory of God. That's what it's all about. God wants to reveal himself to men that don't know him. He wants to show himself to men who've never seen him. He's the invisible God. 
And the world is always asking, show us God, show us Jesus. They said to him, where is he? And he said, I don't know. All he knew was the reality that Jesus had touched him and changed him and that God was real to him. So there was a purpose in this man's blindness and there was a purpose in his apparently hopeless life. And the purpose hadn't been unfolded until the day that Jesus came into his life. He didn't touch him directly. He spat on the ground. And he took his hands and, and he took the dirt upon which he had spat and he made, he made it into a clay. And then he placed the clay on the hands of the blind man, or on the eyes of the blind man, and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam. And here the word of God specifically tells us that the pool of Siloam has an interpretation. It means something. It says by interpretation, sent. The Greek says it is the pool of the sent one. Jesus was the sent one. Jesus was sent from the Father to earth to die in a sinner's place. The pool of Siloam represents in this story the cross of Calvary where Jesus died. It was to the cross that the man was sent. It was to that symbol of the cross, the pool of Siloam. The Jews believed that the waters of the pool of Siloam had a symbolic meaning, that they were connected with the wells of salvation. So there's a tie between the pool of Siloam and the cross of Calvary. And using the blind man as a type of the lost, as a type of the sinner. This is the story. He was sent by the word of God to the cross of Calvary and told this word of faith, Go and wash, and you will come see. He didn't say, Go and understand, for man is not saved by understanding. He's saved by a plunge of faith. A faith that simply casts itself upon what Jesus did at the cross of Calvary without any question. A faith that just says, Lord, I don't understand about the cross. I don't understand about Jesus died. I don't understand how his death 2,000 years ago has anything to do with mine. I don't understand how his dying can affect my destiny. But you sent me here. And you told me to, to wash, to plunge, to trust here. And this is where I rest. This is saving faith. It's the heart that simply reaches out and casts itself upon what Jesus did and what Jesus is for us. And you know what happened to him? He came see. He came back see. He could see. That was the action. Now, we're going to see the reaction. Because when Jesus touches somebody's life, it also touches the lives of others. When a man is changed, when he's transformed by the grace of God, that transformation has a tremendous effect upon others around him. This man became a marvel to his friends, a mystery to his family. They couldn't understand it at all. And he was a misfit, hear this, a misfit in the religious world. The church business kicked him out. They didn't want him. They couldn't stand him. And I'll tell you why later in a later message. First of all, let's look at him as a marvel to his friends. It says in verse 8 that the neighbors, therefore, and they which before had seen him that he was blind, said, is not this he that sat and begged? And some said, this is he. Others said, he's like him. But he said, I am he. Then said they unto him, How were thine eyes open? And then he gave his testimony. <laughs> no wonderful testimony? He said, A man that's called Jesus made clay and anointed mine eyes and said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed, and I received sight. <coughs> So just as soon as this man got back to the pool, and for the sake of our Baptist friends, this doesn't have anything to do with the waters of baptism. The pool was the cross of Calvary, the only fountain where men may be plunged by faith and be made whole. When he came back, when he had been touched, 
when he had been touched, when he had been to the pool, when he had plunged in by faith into the cleansing work of the Lord Jesus Christ, he came back a changed man and affected his neighbors. Neighbors began to talk about him. It was a good sign when the neighbors began to talk about him. The world doesn't think so. They think it's a bad sign when your neighbors talk about you. Jesus said, Beware when all men speak well of you. And the neighbors began to talk about this man. It was circulated all over the neighborhood that something had happened to this man, and they couldn't quite figure out what it was. And when the neighbors got together and began to talk, the only thing they ever talked about was what he used to be and what he used to do. They remembered what they had seen in his life. What had they seen? Well, they had seen that he was blind. Now, they were blind too, spiritually, so it seems difficult that blind people could see a blind man. But they knew this man was blind. They watched him. They could tell by the way he lived. You can tell a blind man by the way he walks. He doesn't walk like a man with sight. He creeps along and he feels his way. His whole life is passed talking about feelings. The blind man staggers. He stumbles. He bumps into things. He falls off curbs. He runs into people. He's always hurting himself. Can't find his way. He doesn't know where he's going. And if you follow him, Jesus said blind leaders only lead others into the ditch. They knew he was blind and watched. And when they got together and began to talk about him after he had been to the cross, after he had been saved, the only thing they could talk about was what he used to be and what he used to do. Your neighbors will never forget what you used to be. They will never forget what you used to do. And there's a good cause for that, a good reason for it. As long as the neighbors can remember what you were and what you did, they feel somewhat comforted in their sin. They can say, aha, he's not so smart. Oh, he talks about being a Christian. He talks about being religious. He says he's going to heaven, but I remember when he did this. And I remember when he said that, and I remember what he was. He can't kid me. Oh, misery loves company. And the neighbors don't know what to do with a man that's been saved, except him to constantly confront him with his past. Well, the past is no burden to me. And it's certainly not upon my conscience. Every one of us would like to go back and change the past. There are pages in my life I'd like to tear out and throw away. Some I'd like to alter. Some I'm sorry ever existed, but they're there. I can't change them. My neighbors and friends who are found on the pages of my life there will never let me forget that either. I remember one woman heard me preach on the radio one time. And oh, she threw a terrible tantrum to one of her neighbors. She said, I wouldn't listen to that man five minutes. I remember him from way back yonder. What does he know? Well, I don't know very much, but I know this. I was blind, now I can see. I know this. Jesus touched me, and he changed me. Of course, I remember what I was, too, and I remember what I did. I sat and begged. What does that have to do with now? I've been to the pool. My past doesn't bother me. God made a promise to those who trusted in Jesus, and he said their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Guess what? He said they'll be taken away as far as the east is removed from the west. They'll be cast behind my back, buried in the deepest part of the ocean. God's not like man that he should remember my sins, my sins and my iniquities. My transgressions were all laid upon the Lord Jesus. And he bore them every one to the cross of Calvary and answered to God for them. And the Bible shows that in the death of the Lord Jesus, God was satisfied for all my sins. My sins are forgiven me for his name's sake. The past is over and the conscience cleansed by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus. But the neighbors will never 
forget, they always remember what you were and what you did. And they got together, and as they began to talk about this man, they said, well, we can't deny what we have seen in his life. This is the man who used to sit and beg. Do you know why they were so disturbed? I'll tell you why they were disturbed. This man had spent his life dependent upon them. His whole life revolved around the world. If the world didn't minister to him, he didn't have anything. If the world didn't help him, he wasn't helped. That's before he had Jesus. <laughs> he sat and begged, dependent upon the world, at the mercy of the world. Whether he lived or died, depended upon the world. And now he's been to the pool, and he can see. And he doesn't need anything the world has. He has Jesus. He don't have to beg anymore. He don't have to depend on the world for anything. He's now trusting in his Heavenly Father. He has Jesus to provide for him all that he needs. He has the promise of the Savior. I will never leave you nor forsake you. He has the promise of the Lord Jesus that he need not fear what others should do to him, for he will always be with him. He has the promise of the Word of God that God has become his Father. And as his Father will provide all he needs before he asks, and do exceeding abundantly above all he can ask or think, He's in this world, but he's not of it anymore. He doesn't have to sit on the temple steps, hold his hand out and beg from a God-hating and Christ-rejecting world. This is the root of the world's hatred of the Christian. They hate him because he is beyond their control. They can't bend him, they can't break him. He's no longer at their mercy. He's finished begging. Now, they were kind of used to him begging. They were kind of used to being God to him. But every time he held his hand out and they flipped him a penny or two, they felt like God. And they could say, well, we're the people that helped the blind man. He needed us and we came through for him. We're something. They took great comfort in their self-righteous acts of mercy, in their almsgiving. He did something for them as long as he sat there in his rags and begged. And now he's been freed from his rags and freed from his begging. And now there's something about this fellow that tells him that he knows where he's going. He can see. That was all right when he couldn't see, but he can see now. And since he can see, he can do his own way, which has become Jesus' way. He didn't want to go anyplace except follow Jesus. Now, Jesus said in the 8th chapter, just before this, I am the light of the world, and he that followeth after me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. This man was walking after Jesus now, and he knew where he was going, and he knew where he'd been. He didn't need anything the world had, and that didn't go down too well with them because the world likes to have you at their mercy and in their power so they can tell you when to go be what they want you to be and they want to make you whatever they need to make you to make them look like they want to look so you can see why the neighbors got uptight about this man getting saved as long as he walked around their scene he was the flea that reminded them they were dogs. As long as he could just walk around and see, they hated him. Ten thousand times would they rather have this man back on the temple steps in his rags begging, blind, than have him walk around and see him. You know, this was a great discovery to me. When the Lord saved me, I was on the verge of alcoholism. I was a bum. I was disgraced in my family. And to myself. And you know, one of the most amazing things that happened to me was after the Lord changed my life. 
But he transformed me by the touch of his own hand like he did here in the blind man. I thought that my old friends would be delighted to see me, and I thought they would be thrilled to hear what Jesus had done in my life. But I found it was just the opposite. That when I saw my old friends and endeavored to tell them what Jesus had done for me, they despised me. And not only did they despise me, they didn't want me in their presence. And the reason they didn't want me in their presence because I was a source of conviction to them. Not really because of what I said, because I didn't know too much to say at the time, but it was because of what I was. Because when they looked at me, they remembered what they were. And they didn't like that constant reminder. And they would rather have seen me as I was than to see me as Jesus had made me. Do you know that's true? Sure it's true. And do you know that why this is why the Pharisees crucified the Lord Jesus? They couldn't stand to let him live. Because every day he lived, they were, they were convicted more and more of what they were. Every day they saw Jesus walk around with light, knowing where he was going and who he was and where he'd been. They realized more and more that they were in darkness. And they thought the only way out was to extinguish this light, put Jesus to death, and then they'd be finished with this thing. And they could go back and be what they thought they were and what they wanted the world to think they were, and especially what they wanted God to think they were. Well, the blind man learned this right quick. You know, he'd been on those temple steps for years and begged. I, I always envisioned this fellow as kind of the town mascot. Everybody knew him. Oh, sure. Let's give him a name. We'll call him Old Blind John. Everybody knows Old Blind John. Sure, Old Blind, blind John. He, he's a nice fellow. Poor fellow where really he can't see. He's blind. Sure, Old Blind John's on the temple steps. Every time I go in, I've tossed him a coin many a time. Everybody knew Old Blind John. But when Old Blind John could see, everybody hated Old Blind John. Because he could see, and Jesus had made him see, and the glory for what had happened in his life was given to Jesus, and they couldn't stand that, because they couldn't get any glory or praise anymore for what they were, what they did. And they wasn't about to have this man Jesus reign over them. So when the neighbors began to talk about him, all they could talk about was what he was and what he did. But there was just one thing about it all. They couldn't deny what they now saw, that he was changed. And the question that came to them was, there must be some trick. Is he really the same man? Are you really the same man? Are you really old blind John? And I imagine his answer to that question would have been no. I used to be old blind John. I'm old seeing John now. I am the same man, but yet I'm not. I told my wife one day, I said, you're one of the few people in this world that's been married once and had two husbands. Figure that out. Married once and had two husbands. But I'm not the man she married. I can show you even photographs to prove that. I'm not the man she married. Not physically, not spiritually, not anything. Yet I am he. I am old blind hurt. But I'm seeing hurt now. And this was the question that came to them. For in some ways he's like that man. He looks like him. I don't imagine he changed his suit the first day he got saved. I don't imagine he changed even his habits of life. For I find out that he just simply came back to where he was in life. But there was something about him that was so different that everybody stopped to look at him. And what they noticed about him was that he could see. It wasn't that they noticed that he didn't go where he used to go or didn't do what he used to do. But they noticed that he could see, he knew where he was going, and he knew where he had been. And he had some kind of an assurance about life 
and a confidence about life and a joy about life and a peace about life that they didn't have in the bundle. They got together, and the neighbors, and they went like this. And they sat around all day, and they talked. Did you hear about old blind John? I saw him down the street the other day, and that fellow was going down through there. Boy, he was just seeing up a storm. <laughs> Big smile on his face, a spring in his foot. I used to see him go down the street, and he was shuffling and dragging his cane and tapping around and bumping into buildings. And everything. I saw him the other day, and he knew where he was going. He knew what life was all about. He looked different. He had a smile on his face. He had joy. He had peace. I, I'm not even sure it's the same guy. Do you think it's the same guy? Well, I, I thought so until I saw him the other day, and then I'm not sure either. He's kind of like him, but he's different. There's something about him that's strange that we don't recognize anymore, and we don't know anymore. And you know, I, I tried to throw a coin in his tin cup the other day, and he said, No, thank you. I have everything I need. My Heavenly Father provided it for me. The Lord Jesus gave it to me in love when He gave me my sight. Now I can see. And then someone must have said, Yeah, but He'll always be old blind John to me. I remember Him too many days sitting down there in His rags. I'll never get that picture out of my mind, ever see Him as anything else. But, what are you going to do when old blind John comes along with a smile on his face, just walk along like he knew where he was going? That soon begins to make the, the picture of what he was and what he did fade. And they couldn't deny the reality of the change in his life. And they came to him finally to ask one simple question. How, how were thine eyes open? They didn't come to him and say, who? The world never asks who, they always ask how. They were confident that he had found some magic medicine, or he had read some great philosophy, or accepted some new creed, or been converted to some doctrine, or joined some church, or some prophet or healer or miracle worker had gotten hold of him and done something. It never occurred to him that this them that the secret of what had happened in his life, the transformation had come to pass, had come through a man they despised and a man they hated, and that was the man called Jesus. And they weren't prepared for what he said, and they didn't want to hear what he said. They came to him and said, How were thine eyes open? And he gave his testimony. But listen to me. This is what I've been teaching you for a long time. You hear in the churches about witnessing, quote unquote, and you're lectured and preached to about your responsibility and your duty to go out and spread your faith to others. And they fill your pockets up with tracts. And they tell you to go out and knock on the door, and when the man comes, say, Howdy, I'm from the First Baptist Church. Here's a tract. Or they tell you that when you meet somebody out in the world, you should back him up against the building and say, Are you saved? And if he says no, you say, Good. Let me quote three verses of Scripture to you. All sin and come short of the glory of God. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now are you saved? And he stands and looks at you like you're insane. You stick a track in his pocket and you go away saying, I witnessed to the man. You did no such thing. I'll tell you what drew these people to the inquiry. What made them ask how? What made them come to the blind man? He didn't come to them. They came to him. And they wanted to know something. They wanted to know how this change had come in his life. He was not witnessing to anybody. He was not passing out tracks. He wasn't propagating his faith. He was walking around being what Jesus had made him. He was walking around being what God had made him in Christ, a transformed, changed man. He would just see him and enjoy it every minute of it. Do you think he liked to see? I imagine that was one of his 
better loved hobbies, don't you? We see. <laughs> Probably asking, what do you do to relax? I see. What do you do for fun? I see. What do you see? Oh, I see things that a lot of people don't see. I go around seeing. He just walked around seeing. He didn't realize that he was doing anything or upsetting his neighbors in any way. He was just going around seeing, enjoying every minute of it. <laughs> I often thought about him looking at things that these neighbors had trampled under their feet for years. And he was delighted. On a daisy, he picks it up and says, look at that. Did you ever see anything as beautiful as that? And his neighbors said, what's the matter? Are you crazy? I've trampled a thousand daisies under my feet, yeah, but I've lived a lifetime and never seen them. And I can see them now for the first time, and it's beautiful. He could see. And when he came back from the pool, he didn't come back saying, I'm not going to smoke cigars anymore, I'm not going to drink booze, I'm not going to run with the women, I'm not going to go to moving pictures and dance halls and hell holes. That isn't what he said. He came back from the pool just seeing. He hadn't changed his clothes nor his habits of life nor anything else, but when you begin to see, sight does have an effect upon you. It begins to change your ideas, it begins to change the way you think, the way you feel, the way you live, the way you act. It does change the places you go and the things you do. But it, that never occurred to him yet. He just came back from the pool and he was seeing. That's all he was worried about. He could just see and he was going around seeing. And his neighbors said he can see. We know that he can see and we know that he couldn't see before. That means something tremendous has happened in his life. How, blind John? Did this happen? He said, and there comes a time in our experience with others, if we will just go around in this world being what we are, there will come a time when someone affected by what they see in our lives will say, How? How? And then we can say what he said. Oh, I like what he said. He said, well, here's how it happened. He was having a revival down to church. No, he didn't say that. <clears throat> he said, I was listening to the Blackwood Brothers saying on the radio. Or he said, in the middle of the night I woke up, and a voice said to me, run out and stand on a big stump in the front yard. And a, bar, a bowl of fire went up my back, and icicles hung on me, and I saw the light, and suddenly I shouted, Glory, Hallelujah. And I knew it happened. No, here's what he said. And here's what I like about it. The man knew how he was saved. And he knew who saved him. And the one that he's stammering around in his answer, when you talk to a man who knows Jesus, and you ask him how he came to be changed, the first thing he will tell you about is Jesus. He'll not say, oh, didn't you know I joined the church? Church don't have anything to do with it. The only church that will ever be in heaven, and the only church Jesus has anything to do with, is the church over which he is the head. And this is a spiritual body of people who are sinners saved by grace. And every man, woman, boy, and girl in this world who believes in Jesus as their Savior belongs to that church. The names are written in heaven in the Lamb's Book of Life where no man can erase it out if he gets mad at you or if you don't contribute enough or don't support the program. Church don't have anything to do with it. Baptism doesn't have anything to do with it. Works don't have anything to do with it. Promises to God don't have anything to do with it. Doctrine doesn't have anything to do with it. Creeds don't have anything to do with it. The change that came in this man's life, the salvation he had, the life he possessed, he got from Jesus. He knew Jesus. He couldn't show Jesus to them because they said, Show him, where is it? He said, I don't know. But I know one thing, I know where he was. <laughs> he was where I was along the road of life. And he touched my eyes and he sent me to the pool and I went. And you'll hear him later in Wednesday night's message. You'll hear him in his, when he's examined by the Pharisees. They churched him, you know. And when they examined him, they asked him hard theological questions. He couldn't answer them. 
He just said, I can't answer. They said, you know the man's a sinner? He said, I don't know whether he's a sinner or not. What do you know? I know this. I was blind and I can see. That's enough to know, isn't it? And I know Jesus did. That's all I need to know. That's all I've known for 23 years. And the religious world hates that knowledge. They hate that knowledge. When they asked him, he said, a man that is called Jesus. He didn't say a church. He didn't say a preacher. He didn't say a creed. He didn't say a doctrine. He didn't say, I'll tell you what I, what I learned. I didn't tell you, I'll tell you what I believe. He told them, the person that had touched his life, Jesus changed him. Jesus touched him. Jesus gave him sight. It was Jesus. How do you suppose he felt towards Jesus? We well, loved it. That's the fruit of faith, for it's faith itself. True saving faith is falling in love with Jesus because he first loved us. How do you think a blind man felt about Jesus? He loved him. And nobody going to bad mouth Jesus to him. The Pharisees tried, and they said, That's all right. I can't ask your questions. I won't enter into debate with you. All I know is this. I was blind and I can see when Jesus did it. And that's all I care about. This was his testimony. He knew how he was saved. He knew Jesus had saved him. He knew the church didn't have anything to do with it. He knew religion didn't have anything to do with it. Good grief, Charlie Brown. He sat on the steps of the temple for all his life. And the priest passed him by. And the Levites passed him by. And the people passed him by. And the temple, with all its religion, with all its formalism, with all its teaching, all of its dusty library of books and laws and rules and traditions, couldn't help him one bit. All they could do is feel sorry for him because he wasn't like them. Throw him a bone every now and then. He knew the temple didn't have anything to do with his salvation. He knew the priest didn't have anything to do with it. He knew that no teaching had anything to do with it. It was a man that saved him. It was the man, Christ Jesus. Paul said, this is a worthy saying, and this is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. And this blind man was a sinner, and Jesus saved him. He knew it, and that's all he needed to know, and that's all he needs to know for all eternity. Loved him and sent Jesus to die for him. It was Jesus that touched his life and changed him and made him whole. And this is the proof of the gospel, dear brethren. He had been to the pool, and the pool had changed him. He told him that. He said, Jesus came and he anointed my eyes and he sent me to the pool. And all I know is that I went to the pool and I washed and I came seeing. Here is the proof of the gospel we preach. And here is the proof of the gospel in your life and mine. How do you know you've been saved? And how do I know I've been saved? I know it because I can see it. I know it because I love Jesus. And it's very clear to me that it is Jesus who touched me, and Jesus who saved me, and Jesus who enabled me to see. How'd the blind man know? He'd been changed. He could see. <laughs> now, you know, I have an idea that people try to convince him he couldn't see. Because <laughs> it's just exactly like the religious world. They say, no, come on, now you can't see, you know you can't. He said, are you kidding me? I can see you for what you are. <laughs> Don't you imagine they came to him and they said, Now look, blind job. Quit going on with this hypocrisy. Just tell us that you can't see. It makes us all feel better if you do. <laughs> and he said, But I can see. Uh, we don't believe you. Like the man said to me one time, Yeah, you say you have peace, but I don't believe you. 
You say your sins are forgiven, you know that, but I don't believe you. As though that just wiped the whole thing out, you know. Yeah, you say that you know Jesus, but I don't believe you. And so I could only say to him, like, well, that doesn't change anything. I'm sorry you can't believe, and I'm sorry that you don't believe what I say to you. It doesn't keep me from going around seeing. <laughs> the blind man wasn't going to put any blinders on so he could satisfy them. He could see, and he knew he could see. Do you think a man could know whether he sees or not? Of course he does. And the blind man knew that he could see. He knew that he had been to the pool in a saving way because he could see. I suppose somebody said to him, What's, How do you know that you can really see? How are you, how are you so positive that you're saved? What is the grounds of your assurance of salvation? Do you suppose a blind man would have said, Well, I feel like I can see. You know, I've had people tell me, I feel like I'm saved. Well, I feel like I can see. Well, there's some mornings I feel like I'm saved, and there's some days I feel like I'm not. Did you ever have that experience? A blind man doesn't rest on feelings. If he'd been resting on feelings, he'd been the bad way. Well, suppose me ask him, how do you know that I've been saved? Would he have said this? Oh, I know that I can see because Jesus said, if you will go to the pool and wash, you will be able to see. And I can't really see, but I just take him in his word and trust his promise, and therefore I know him saved. No. Yet this is precisely what churches teach. They teach that there doesn't have to be any change in your life. They teach that you don't have to be able to see. All you have to do is just take the promise of God and say, God says if I trust in Jesus, I'll be saved. And I trusted him, therefore I know I'm saved. I don't see any change. I can't see. Nothing's happened. But I hang on to that promise. Oh, no. is isn't so. When you've been to the pool, you can see. That's the point of the story, isn't it? You can see. It doesn't say you can feel. It says you can see. It doesn't say you hold on to the promise. It says you can see. Or supposing if they asked him what his assurance of salvation was, he would have said this. Well, I used to sit on the temple steps and beg, but I don't sit there anymore. That's the reason I know him to say, well, there's lots of beggars quit begging and went to something else. That doesn't mean Jesus did anything for them. I heard a man tell me one time, he said, I know I'm a Christian. I said, how do you know? He said, I used to be a drunkard, now I'm sober. I said, good grief, Alcoholics Anonymous, full of people like you. Well, that doesn't have anything to do with Jesus, does it? No. Salvation is not being saved from drink, although that's probably included. It's being saved from sin. It's being saved from hell. It's being saved from a Christless eternity. It's being saved, most of all, from ourselves. Now, God's anonymous can't do all that. <laughs> he couldn't say, well... I used to be this way, and now I'm this way, and therefore I'm saved because I know that what I used to do I don't do anymore. He knew he was saved simply because he could see. That was the new thing in his life. I don't think the sight instantaneously changed his life. I think it was the beginning of a vast change in his life. But I don't think that vast change came overnight. Now, supposing you've been in darkness all your life. You had never seen the ordinary things in life. You've never seen a table. You've never seen a chair. You've never seen a door. You've never seen a house. You've never seen an article of clothing. You've never seen another human face. You've never seen your own face. Your own face was strange to you, and the faces of others were unknown to you. Or you could feel, but feel was all you could do. Well, feelings get you into all kinds of trouble. Supposing you went to a blind man who had never been able to see and gave him a strange object and said, feel it and tell me what you think it is. You'd be amazed at what he'd tell you. He wouldn't have the slightest idea. He'd run his hands over and he'd say, well, it feels like... But could he ever be sure? And could he ever really see it for what it was and know it for what it was? Of course he couldn't. 
And if you'd lived in darkness all your life as this blind man had and suddenly had your eyes open, it would take just a little while for all that you were seeing to have its effect upon your life. But there would be some things that would be changed right suddenly. You would see that that thing you had named a table might really be a chair. You say, you know, I thought for years that thing was a table, and now I see it's a chair. Or I thought for years that that was the door to the outside of the house, and it's the closet door. Or I thought for years that this thing I sat on was a chair, and it's a table. Wouldn't it change his ideas? And uh, his friends would come in and notice that he always sat on a table, but now he's sitting in a chair. They'd say, how come? He said, well, I can see now. Just pardon me for all those years I sat on the table, but I can see now. Of course it changes your life. Light has to change your life. When you can see, your ideas begin to change. And what you think and what you are down inside begins to change what you are outside. I'm sure that the habits of the blind man changed. I imagine there was a time when he never showed up at his begging spot again. There was a time when he even took the rags off. He could see now. But it took time. But the day he came from the pool, all of those changes hadn't come yet. The only thing he knew for sure and the only thing he could comprehend was this. He was blind and now he could see. He didn't have any idea how this sight would change his life in days to come. But he knew he could see. And he knew that it was all right. And everything was going to be different from this day on. You heard me tell, I'm sure, but I can't help but tell it again. And when Jesus saved me, the only thing I could say was, it's all right. I remember going to bed at night, and I was afraid to tell my wife because I have lied to her so many times. And I told her so many big stories about what I was going to do and what I was going to be and how I was going to be changed. And then I tried, I couldn't do it. And I was, I was ashamed to tell her for fear that it wouldn't work. And I thought, well, if Jesus has really changed me, she'll be the first one to know about it. Because one of these days it will be apparent to her. But I went to bed that night just saying over and over and over in my heart, it's all right. It's all right. I didn't have the slightest idea of the change that would come in my life. If I could have looked forward to this day, I wouldn't have believed what I see now. But I knew one thing. I could see, and it was all right. And whatever changes came, the changes would have been made by Jesus, and it would be good for me and bring glory to him. That's all the blind man knew. He didn't understand theology. He didn't understand religion, as you will hear on Wednesday night. They razzle-dazzled him with their fancy theological footwork. But they couldn't shake him loose from one thing, and that is I was blind and I could see, and Jesus did this and brought it to pass in my life. You just keep saying that long enough, you're going to get religion awful mad at you. And you're going to get the church business awful stirred up against you. And you're going to make your neighbor's tongues wag 90 miles an hour. And you're going to be driven out of the places of worship. But you'll notice that when they kicked him out of the temple, Jesus met him on the sidewalk. And they went down the street together. Blind men just seeing up a storm, having fellowship with Jesus, and the whole world saying, You can't see, you can't see, you can't see. This is what happens in the Christian's life. This is the change that Jesus brings. Now let me close with just one thought for you. I've said all morning that he can see. What could he see? What could he see? Oh, well, birds and bees and cottage cheese. That's one thing he could see. He could see houses and trees and <coughs> probably didn't have Dodge automobiles in Jerusalem anymore. <laughs> he could see lots of things that people need to see, but there were other things that he could see too. First thing he saw, the first thing he saw was himself. Man never gets saved till he sees himself. 
Not as he thinks he is. He had seen himself as he thought he was for years. Don't you imagine? He imagined that he was a handsome devil. He was blind. We all imagine that. We all like to stand in front of here and say, "Good looking beast, you." Don't you imagine this blind man thought he was pretty handsome? Now imagine this. He can't see a lick. He's going like this. He says, "Boy, you are a handsome devil." Feel that hair. Hmm. What hair? <laughs> Those muscles. Boy. Well, I bet you're about the biggest man in Jerusalem. He couldn't see. He may have only been five foot two, weighed 120 pounds. But he hadn't gone around and measured everybody else in Jerusalem because he couldn't see. <laughs> he couldn't see himself and he couldn't see anybody else. So any ideas he had about himself were no good. Were they now? Oh, no good. Since he couldn't see himself and he couldn't see anybody else, how could he get a proper perspective of what it was? He couldn't. And he never did until he was sent to the pool. But when he got to the pool, he could see himself. He saw himself. And I'll tell you, when you see yourself in the light of the cross, you will not like what you see. It will make you quickly look to him. Who is beautiful to behold, and that's the Lord Jesus. When you see yourself as God sees you, you see yourself as a poor, lost, hell-deserving sinner, under the wrath of God, chief of sinners, as Paul called himself. The blind man saw himself as he really was. He saw the rags he had lived in for years and thought they were the finest suit in town. He saw the self-righteousness that had clothed him for all of those years and was ashamed of what he saw. He saw his face reflected in the pool. That's where you see yourself, the Calvary, reflected. Jesus died there in your place and in your stead. And if you were so good, he would have never died that death. The death he died it gives you a fair example of what you are in the sight of God. Well, he didn't die just a physical death there. It wasn't just the nails and the crown of thorns. He died an eternal death. He descended, the Bible teaches, into hell for you. He suffered the wrath of God and stood at the judgment bar of God and received all that belonged to you for your sins and your iniquities, was plunged into outer darkness and died crying, My God, why hast thou forsaken me? And the blind man first saw his own image reflected in the pool. And the next thing he saw was Jesus. Oh, he came back and he looked into the face of Jesus and he seen him and he'd never seen him before. He loved him. He was more than his Savior. He was overwhelmed with his love. No wonder he went around Jerusalem telling people about Jesus. It's Jesus who loved me. It was Jesus who came to me in my darkness. It was Jesus who gave me sight. It was Jesus who set me free. It was Jesus who changed my life. People got tired of hearing about Jesus when they were around him. And then there was something else he could see. He could see others. Not in a critical way. He saw himself reflected in others. He said what most believers can say as they see others. Walking in blindness. There but by the grace of God am I. And he saw in the face of every man what he could be if Jesus touched him. The life he could have, the joy he could experience, the peace he could possess. <clears throat> if Jesus could touch his life too. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we thank you this morning for the precious word of God. We thank you for the reality that there is in Jesus. We pray, Father, that those who are saved will just be enabled by the Holy Spirit to go around this world being what they are, manifest the reality and the joy of walking in fellowship with Jesus. And we pray that those who shall touch our lives will be impressed by what they see, not what they hear, but by what they see so impressed that they will be drawn to ask us that we might give them words 
They will magnify and glorify thee and say, Jesus did it all and he will do it for them. And Father, for those who are unsaved, we pray the Holy Spirit will take this message and make them to understand how much you love them, how much Jesus wants to change them and give them the real abundance of life. Help them to see that salvation is not so much to do with heaven and hell as it is with delivering us from the hell we live in and giving us the abundant life of his fellowship here. Oh, how the blind man's world was changed, delivered out of darkness into light and from begging to an abundance. Thank you, Father, for this reality, and we leave it all with you in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord bless you.